When was the last time that you prayed for something or someone passionately? Not once or twice, but relentlessly. Not with that situation or that person out there at some distance on a prayer list without you being existentially involved in your request. When did you pray for that person as if you were next to them? When did you pray for that situation as if you were yourself in it? Many of us, at least myself, would feel a little uneasy answering that question in the quiet of our conscience this morning. But my goal is not to examine your conscience, but to go further and to encourage each of us, in light of what Isaiah is saying to us this morning, to review and to renew, by God's grace, your life of prayer. This exhortation, as I'm trying to, to hint, is part of the good news that Isaiah is bringing to us. His message is not ultimately one of condemnation, but of faith in God's person, in His power to act, in His attributes, in His promises, in His utter reliability. As is always the case, though, with the Gospel, we have to start with the bad news. And that's what Isaiah himself does, if you think of his book, starting in chapter 1, and for much of the book. He doesn't pull any punches when he describes the sin that ravages the vast majority of the Judean community of his day, and which will have the same effect later. And as we've just read, this sin has metaphorically and literally taken them captive by the time the exile comes about. Sins of every stripe are alleged, sins of, the, of worship, sins in private, sins in public, violent sins, hidden sins. He describes them in detail, and yet his audience seems implacable, unmoved, dismissive of his message. Yet the book of Isaiah is called the fifth gospel for good reason. Amid this barrage of sin and apparently insuperable obstacles, ones they can't get over on their own, God remains king. He's the king of his people. He's the king of the peoples. And he's king of all things. As king, Isaiah assures Judean kings, his readers as well, God will destroy his enemies and save his people, even when they think that he's not able to, even when they act as if he's not even involved. God and only God says things like this. This is the first verse of chapter 65, so the beginning of his response to the prayer we just read. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. Coming back to the prayer, the difference between the world as it is and the fulfillment of God's covenantal purposes to renew all things lies at the heart of Isaiah's prayer. Isaiah foresees that Judah, even after its nominal return from exile, we use that phrase to describe that, that event in the Old Testament, but it's really not really ended. Even after the nominal end of exile in Babylon, Judah will be in desperate circumstances. But on the one hand, Isaiah's passion for his people's restoration and his passion for God's glory flow together in this prayer and almost overwhelm him. He says things that, to put it in these terms, might not be easily integrated in systematic theology. Take verse 17, for example, of the passage we just read. Why do you make us wander from your ways? Why do you harden our hearts from fearing you? In verse 19, translators have felt compelled to add a comparative like that is not in the Hebrew text. If we read it without the comparative, we have this. We have become those over whom you have never ruled, those you never called your name over. Despite what some commentators suggest, it is not the case that Isaiah doesn't recognize guilt for sin on his part or on the part of his people. As the context shows and as the rest of the book shows, Isaiah is fully aware of sin as the root cause of the problems of Judah in real time in the 8th century and in the post-exilic context he's prophesying about here. Nowhere does he imply, much less state, that his people's behavior is not fully their responsibility. But that means that this seemingly unsolvable problem remains. Isaiah desires the salvation of his fellow Judeans and the fulfillment of God's covenantal purposes from the bottom of his heart. Yet his people seem entrenched in their sin, stuck in their sin, unable and even unwilling to change. That's the situation that drives Isaiah to pray as he does. 
O that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would shake at your presence. In reflecting with you on this remarkable passage this morning, my goal is not simply to tell you to go and pray as Isaiah prayed. Simply repeating his words, of course, is simply superficial, and there are significant differences between his situation and ours. Instead, I want to see with you the theology, the loves, the desires that give birth to this prayer. Far from being a technique or a skill, prayer is our response to God in light of who he is. This is how Calvin puts it. After we have been instructed by faith to recognize that whatever we need and whatever we lack is in God and in our Lord Jesus Christ, it remains for us to seek in Him and in prayers to ask of Him what we have learned to be in Him. So if we can, under God's Word and by a Spirit, deepen our knowledge of Him even a little, our prayers and our lives will be noticeably and progressively changed. So, I invite you to think through the message of this passage with me in light of four questions. First, why is Isaiah's prayer so desperate, so importunate? Second, how does Isaiah pray, meaning how does he build his requests, how does he think as he speaks to God about this desperate situation? Third, how does God respond? And fourth, what does all this mean for us and our prayers? So. First, why is Isaiah's prayer so impassioned? We've seen part of the answer already. Isaiah foresaw, in the, post, in the post-exilic context, major differences between the status quo of God's people and the eschatological endpoint where the trajectory of all these covenants are ultimately going. You can trace them through various covenants, in fact, Abrahamic and Mosaic and Davidic. God had chosen Abraham's line as the vehicle for his saving purposes, for the world. Yet Judah's tragic circumstances made the fulfillment of that promise seem very distant, if not impossible. Judah was unable to be a light to the nations, as she had been called to be. The nations, for their part, persist in the pursuit of glory and honor and power, as if that were all that mattered. At Mount Sinai, God invited Israel, the people he had just redeemed from centuries of bondage and oppression, to be his treasured possession, his kingdom of priests, his holy nation. Yet upon their return from exile, skipping over the entire period that led there, their sins continued and their punishments weighed them down and threatened their very existence. Again, God had promised to David that he would rule the nations through one of his descendants. Isaiah himself prophesied in chapter 9 of a son of David who would be born and whose government and peace would know no end. But, in the future that Isaiah foresees, the Judeans' homeland will become Persian territory. The temple will be destroyed. God's rule through a descendant of David seems to come to an end. We can understand, then, why Isaiah implores God to act with such passion, with such desperation. The divine promises seem to be terribly slow in terms of their fulfillment. Second, then, how does Isaiah build his prayer? How does he formulate his request? What is his theological rationale? The fact that Isaiah even prays rather than collapsing in a hopeless heap shows us that he believes that God hears prayer and that God is faithful to his promises and true to himself. Isaiah's prayer is indeed born of desperate circumstances, but several fundamental realities prevent him from despair. The prophet is fully aware of the cause of Judah's critical condition. It is not divine inattention. It is not divine unfaithfulness. There is surely some chronological tension or perceived delay between God's covenant promises and the post-exilic status quo. But there's no theological mystery that needs to be resolved here. Judah's sin and spiritual lethargy remain characteristic even after the punishment of exile, which was supposed to interrupt that and correct that. This explains its current lackluster condition as the sanctions of the Sinai Covenant once again start to bear down on them in famine, oppression by their enemies, and so on. Isaiah's prayer is not born of frustration with God, certainly not an accusation of him. Rather, it flows from hope in God's gracious promises, in the same ones that seem, whose fulfillment seems to be delayed, especially the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. 
God has committed himself graciously and freely to his people Israel. This commitment cannot be undone even by Israel's sin. Isaiah is asking Yahweh, the God who made himself known in the Exodus, a paradigm that's very important for Isaiah, to overcome once and for all Israel's perennial problem with sin and to glorify himself by bringing his covenant purposes for them and for the world to fulfillment. Notice the rhetorical questions that Isaiah sometimes uses to add force to his requests. Just before the passage we read in 63, but verses 11 and 12, with reference to the Exodus, where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name? It's as if Isaiah is saying, God, this is who you are, and these are your people. Save them and glorify yourself as you did in the Exodus. God's promises are not the only foundation for Isaiah's prayer. A few verses further, the first verse we read, verse 15, the prophet reminds God, as it were, of his feelings for his people. Where are your zeal and your might that you exercise on their behalf? Even more intimately, the prophet feels that God's unchangeable commitments, his very compassion for his people, is restrained, withheld. Even this soul-bearing honesty, however, is not accusation or despair. In his profound desire to see God overcome the sinfulness of his people, Isaiah verbalizes the most personal, the most tender terms of the covenant relationship. Again, it's as if he says, Lord, it's with this life-giving love and commitment that you established a relationship with your people, again and again in various covenants. We want nothing more than to know you as our Father and as our Redeemer, but our sins are between us and you. Overcome them. Take them away. We are the clay and you are our potter. So, thirdly, how does God respond to this impassioned request? We are dangerously familiar with the nature of God's reply. Dangerously, I say, because grace must never become automatic, taken for granted, natural, normal. But if we appreciate that properly, God's reply is astounding. He adds one superlative to another, one incredibly gracious response to another. The first description, at least in terms of explicit responses to Isaiah's requests, we have to look at 65.9 for this, involves precisely the fulfillment of his promises to Abraham and to David, to bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. The trio of land, people, and king is then taken up in God's astonishing promise that he will create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. On the contrary, be glad and rejoice in what I create. So as we turn to what all this means for us and our prayers, we have to reckon with the fact that God's continued work of redemption, foreseen but not experienced by Isaiah, puts us in a situation that entails greater privileges as well as greater responsibilities. God, in the most remarkable way imaginable, has torn open the heavens and come down in the person of his Son. The suffering servant that Isaiah said would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities has taken away once and for all the sins of God's people and brought spiritual wholeness and healing. Christ was forsaken on the cross that we might never be forsaken. The new creation just read as we read from 65, has begun already in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As the final son of David, he has opened the scroll and even now guides history towards its intended end. Isaiah's jealous recollection of God putting his Holy Spirit in the midst of his Old Testament people, this is Numbers 14 or 11, uh, limited as it was to equipping some Israelites for judging and prophesying is far surpassed by the permanent presence and recreative work of the Spirit of Christ as he transforms every believer into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
And this is just the beginning of the endless list of blessings that God gives to those who love him. But it is more than enough for us to draw together the threads we've seen as we focus finally on some encouragements to persevere in fervent, impassioned prayer for the things that matter most. That inevitably means prayers that arise from the tension between the world as it is, our life as it is, our church, our neighbor, and the fulfillment of God's promises to renew all things, to vanquish evil, and to consummate the salvation of his people. <coughs> the bedrock of Isaiah's fervent, fervent prayer and intercession is God himself. We've looked briefly at how God's character and God's covenant promises support Isaiah's petitions and lament. We've also seen, even in a very short passage, that God's glory is the ultimate goal of Isaiah's prayer, even when, at the same time, Isaiah feels the needs of his people acutely. Let's focus now on how God himself, through his word and spirit, in this very passage, encourages us in and even beyond our laments, beyond our petitions that seem to change nothing, but which are in fact extremely precious and effective, sometimes albeit in ways that we don't fully perceive. So I'll give you six encouragements to persevere in the kinds of prayer that Isaiah models for us here. First, remember that God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, prays for us when our prayers fall short. This is what Paul teaches us in Romans 8.26. God himself helps us pray. There we read, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. This verse appears in the middle of Paul's discussion of hope in this very tension that I've been talking about, between things as they are now and things as they will one day be when God consummates his purposes. In this case, we're waiting eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Whatever weaknesses we feel in prayer, and they may be many, the Spirit of God is fully able to overcome them as he joins with us in bearing the burdens that our weakness imposes upon us. To put it in other terms, God's fatherly tenderness and generosity are such that he enables us to pray for the very things we most need to pray for. How can we not pray with gratitude and with expectation as we offer through Christ prayers aided by his spirit? Second, remember that the gospel is ultimately God's cause. It may be that the gospel ministry sometimes seems to be without discernible fruit. Notice I've qualified that several ways because that's never the case. As Isaiah himself says, God's word never returns to him void. John Webster captures this point powerfully in a short passage I'll read. The divine word, he says, is victor. God's revelatory self-gift is not hindered by the initial absence of reception because it is an effective word. There is a false pessimism which fails to admit the continuing missions of word and spirit in overcoming that defection. In that context, he quotes Isaiah 29, 18, and it is, it is marvelously well suited. The deaf, you have to, you have to grasp the, the self-contradictory nature of the statement unless something supernatural were going on. The deaf shall hear the words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. Clearly something supernatural is presumed here. This is nothing less than God calling things that are not as though they were. God gives, creative li gives life to the spiritually dead through his word. No pastor, no believer should be disheartened or discouraged as long as God's word stands. And it stands forever. Third, remember that God treasures our tears. Our most heartfelt prayers may take the form of lament, and there's plenty of scriptural warrant for that. In your laments, remember that God cares, not as you or I care, but as God alone can care. God compassionately, in the image of Psalm 56, collects in his bottle the tears that accompany our most fervent prayers, emptying our hearts before him then in lament is not a gesture of despair, but an agonized waiting for the fulfillment of his righteous 
promise. Fourth, remember the value of suffering. Given the paucity of lament in much current theology and liturgy, it's worth addressing a specific and very difficult kind of prayer, one offered by or for a sufferer who has long prayed for deliverance, yet still waits for it. Being aware that brevity is often the wisest approach in these circumstances, uh, let me at least start with a brief observation that will help orient us. Biblical wisdom is to admit that God can be justified without being fully understood. There's a lot wrapped up in that short statement, but two points are crucially important for us. The limits of our understanding and the absolute goodness of God. However, we navigate prolonged suffering, this foundation must be in place. And in God's tender mercy, it will prove to be enough, as Job eventually learned. What's more, as Mark Taylor reminds us, God is glorified in us when we continue faithfully to acknowledge and proclaim His truth in spite of the fact that we are unable to conceive how any alteration to our future circumstances could make our lives seem good and pleasurable again. In other words, in the most extreme suffering, when even future modifications of, of our lives wouldn't change what had already happened, what we already feel now, God can be glorified when we suffer as described here, acknowledging His goodness even when we cannot explain why these things have happened. On this foundation, we can pray both for the end of our suffering and for God to teach us through it. Suffering can and should, indeed, produce clear benefits, whether by challenging our shallow confidence in ourselves, by destroying our belief that life's ordinary goods can satisfy us, or in any other number of ways. Fifth, remember, remember that intercession is a privilege. Isaiah prayed not only for himself, but, as we've seen in our passage, for others. This concern for others and the intercessory prayer produces our divine gifts. This is so especially because Jesus Christ is the archetypal intercessor and advocate. This is also why concern for others is a basic feature of the Christian life, as described in the New Testament. Think of Philippians 2. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Indeed, in interceding for others, we reflect faintly the intercessory heart of Christ Himself. We also manifest our dependence upon Him as we do so. As Michael Widmer reminds us in his book on intercession, it's only through the atoning sacrifice of Christ and His redemptive mediation that we can even bring our prayers before God. But if He so loves us and prays for us, how can we not love and pray for one another? Sixth, and this is perhaps a point that requires a bit more uh, reflection we have to remember that this world is not our home. Prayer is presented in Isaiah and throughout Scripture inevitably, inevitably involves us redirecting our loves from the things of this world, a very benign sounding phrase, but it's not benign at all, to God and His good purposes. It's a, in other words, it's a radical reorientation that is called for any time we pray, that is necessary to prayer and should be part of what we are praying for. Finding this world a little too much like our home probably explains why we don't pray as passionately as we should for God to work and to return. We're not heavenly minded enough. This is not to say, of course, that this world and what happens in it is not important. Far from it. While being weaned from this world is beneficial, as I'm trying to say, some of us might need a stronger appreciation for what God is doing here and now in the not yet, or sorry, in the already. Fervent prayer indeed is absolutely necessary if we are to live faithfully in the tension between the already and the not yet, or to come down to the very practical, between petition and deliverance as requested. This between the ages dynamic, which is very much, even if life is going well, a struggle, is inevitable if we are to honor God and fulfill His will in the circumstances that in His fatherly providence and goodness He puts in our lives. This puts the lie to the idea that one can truly be too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. Quite the contrary. Good theology lived out, including the strong desire to enter fully into the inheritance of the saints and to see God's saving purposes come to fruition, is the source of fervent prayer 
and a life that honors God here and now. So, the more that we know God and the more that we long to see his glory revealed in the salvation of sinners like us, the more we will pray that the gospel would run swiftly here and now, even as we look forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we close in prayer, we do so with this final encouragement from our text. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. Let's pray. O Lord, teach us to pray. Increase our knowledge of you, the triune God, so that we might pray more fervently. Align our hearts, align our desires with your promises, your purposes, your character. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you help us in our weakness. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that as our only high priest, you intercede for us without ceasing. That in your resurrection, we have the sure pledge of our resurrection to eternal life. Accompany us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit through this life and bring us into your kingdom where you will be all and in all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.